Good afternoon and welcome to today's session. Uh, you will need resources on our Padlet and uh, in our Google folder. Uh, I'm going to put those links in the chat. Um, we have been utilizing the same Padlet, so you might already have that bookmarked if you've been here in previous sessions. Uh, today's session is supporting graduation and post-secondary success of SLIFE. And we wanted to start off with a from a place of gratitude. Uh, we know that you've been working hard all day supporting our MLs in SLIFE, and we appreciate you taking the time out to join us for this session on supporting graduation and post-secondary success. One of our co-facilitators this afternoon is Diane Sear Fenner. Uh, she is the president president of Support Ed, and she'll be joining us shortly. My name is Shannon Smith, and I'm one of our multilingual learner coaches with Support Ed. Just a little Zoom tip. Uh, please feel free to ask any questions in the chat. Uh, and uh, we will also be adding uh, messages on relevant links and other uh, support. Uh, all of our communication will come through uh, with three asterisks on each end. We are a small group, so uh, there'll be plenty of opportunities to share out uh, with the whole group. Uh, we will have at least one breakout room this evening, um, and uh, there's plenty of opportunities to share through the chat. Um, we will have some independent work near the end where we're planning for our contacts. Uh, feel free to turn off your video while you're working and turn it back on when you're ready to join the group. Document one in the Google folder has an overview of the four sessions uh, for SLICE that we've had this fall. Um, this is our fourth session. Um, and uh, on that document, for sessions one through three, uh, you will find links to uh, the archived recordings on the Department of Education website. So thank you for those of you who have been uh, joining us throughout the sessions. Uh, we do uh, take your feedback seriously. And um, some of the glows you shared with us is uh, you've appreciated the concrete tools and strategies and the collaboration with colleagues. Um, and you would like more time to discuss in breakout groups and more examples in low incidence settings. Um, so we're gonna continue to provide the strategies and tools and provide examples from a variety of settings, uh, along with more time to discuss and apply uh, strategies and tools. In today's session, uh, we're going to be discussing barriers and solutions related to graduation and post-secondary success for SLIFE, uh, explore strategies for supporting graduation and post-secondary success, and apply those strategies to plan for implementing them for graduation and post-secondary success of SLIFE in your context. We have a few session icons that you'll see um, tonight, uh, well, this afternoon, uh, any materials in our Google folder, you'll see the Google Drive icon, um, the, any materials available on the Padlet, uh, you'll see the Padlet icon, discussion activities will have the chat icon, and anytime we meet in breakout rooms, you'll see the little rooms, and that'll appear in the bottom right-hand corner. I did share previously our Padlet, but I'll share it again. Um, we do, we've been using the same Padlet of resources um, throughout all four sessions, so you can have access to all of that, uh, the resources from every session. Um, when you land on the Padlet, just going to slide over. We're in the purple columns today. Um, the slides for today's presentation, oh, I do that every time, I think. The slides for the Google presentation are in the first column and um, then the Google folder of resources. Uh, um, the second column has all of the additional resources. For our agenda today, um, we'll start off by talking about barriers and solutions, followed by strategies, and then give you that time to plan for implementing those strategies and sharing that out with some of your colleagues here today. And you can get the full agenda. Beep. 
here. And if you would like to unmute and just share what you're looking forward to, or even just putting in the chat what you're looking forward to out of today's session. This is a little bit different, Shannon, but I was wondering if you already gave information about the Padlet and if we'll be able to access it. Yes. After um, today's session. Oh, yes. Um, our Padlets, once you have that link to the Padlet, it is active um, and you can access it well into the future. Okay. Thank you. Because we know that like tonight you're going to look at some of those things, but for mm -hmm. most of it, it's a resource you're going to want to look at maybe a month from now or even a, a year from now and be mm -hmm. able to access those. And I know you and, and Robin are also working with various districts. Um, yes. As since these sessions are recorded as well, um, your participant, any participants that are watching the videos will have access to the same Padlet and the same uh, uh, Google folder resources. Great, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Did that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Is there anything that anybody is looking forward to for th this evening or let's see. Uh, Robin, the assessing credits uh, for classes taken internationally or when a student doesn't have a transcript. Um, I think we have that um, as part of our framework a little bit tonight as we go on further. Oh, and Laura, that reaching the goals and how long it takes. Um, we talking about some data um, and uh, I think uh, some other pieces. So those are really two good, uh, good pieces that you're looking forward to this evening. I keep saying this evening. I think it's that, that time change and it's getting darker earlier. So I want to say evening when it's afternoon. Um, and grading for SLIF secondary. And advocating. I think advocating is always a good one. Learning more about the topic and how it intersects. Um, Hannah, what is your role? While I'm here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm the McKinney Bento. I'm sorry, I have a little bit of a cold. I heard you talking about feeling sick, um, but I am the McKinney Bento Outreach Specialist at Preble Street in Portland. And I work with schools in York and Cumberland counties to support students who are experiencing housing instability or homelessness. Oh, great. So, that's it. Thank you for joining us this evening. Yeah, afternoon. thanks for having me. So let's start off by looking at some of those barriers and solutions um, and just thinking about some of those pieces. Um, just looking at um, this map comes from uh, a U.S. Department of Education report um, that looked at the graduation rates um, in each state um, I think around 2015, 2016 school year. And you can see at least 60% of um, multilingual learners were graduating within four years. Um, however, while that average number was increasing, it's still far below the average for all students. So the amount of students in large, to your point of looking at some of that data, the amount of multilingual learners that are, are graduating within that four year time span is far less than the average of just all of our students. And when we look at the estimates for the graduation rates for SLIFE, it's mm -hmm. even far lower than that. And in pulling some of that data from uh, Maine over the last seven years, uh, the percentage of multilingual learners um, and all students that graduated uh, in four years, in five years, and in six years, your multilingual learners are still lagging behind in terms of that percentage, then you're looking at all students. And um, while you're finding more success over time, given extra time, like you know, it's approximately 3% less between given that five or six years, we want to make sure that we're thinking about that success and getting them to their goal 
in, closer to that four year time if, if possible. Um, uh, I do not have that statistic, Kathy, I'm sorry, uh, about how many did graduate uh, and then went on to get GEDs. Um, that is a, po a possibility. Um, but even still, I know as Maine is working on that uh, SLIF definition, we'll be able to uh, gather, you'll be able to have more data on that SLIF graduation rate over time as that, that uh, definition is implemented. And Robin is making us all smile this evening by the addition of a puppy. <laughs> Yes, she's uh, she's decided that I've been unavailable too much today. <laughs> Sorry. I think we've all been there. And so, um, and I, Kathy, I appreciate that question because when we think about you know what the research tells us is that you know multilingual learners and especially SLIFE, you know there there's consequences if we're not graduating or having a plan for that post secondary success um so multilingual learners are twice as likely to drop out as proficient students and slife have an even higher likelihood um so there's there's consequences to both slife and to society at large when our, our students are dropping out um, we want to make sure that we're creating systems, uh, data systems that can inform decision making, but then also being able to support uh, SLIFE and their families as their goal setting and planning for college or their career. Um, and that starts with being able to, and I think some of what you're looking forward to is exploring how do we give access, how do we look at transcripts, uh, how do we look at it, decide placement for students that don't have transcripts, or even just being able to give access to our, our SLIFE that they can have more credit bearing higher level courses that can get them to where their career goals are. Uh, Carol Salva um, did a dissertation recently on uh, a lot of the supports that lead to graduation success for SLIFE and um, factors that positively impacted SLIFE graduation in her, uh, that she noted was uh, including family that is encouraging and that the students felt that sense of obligation to be successful. Uh, that schools were taking an assets-based approach to build upon SLIFE funds of knowledge and then also provided uh, additional academic supports. Um, and there was those partnerships with community organizations that help build a welcoming and supportive community for SLIFE and their families. And welcome, Diane. I think this leads to you. It does. Thanks. I apologize for joining here a little bit late today. Um, so we're going to go into our first breakout rooms. And I'm thinking two rooms, Shannon, based on the number of participants we have this afternoon. Great. Um, so you'll be in either group one or group two. You will find your slide in document three. And let me bring up a link to that. All right, let me just share those directions in the chat because I'm talking here. Okay. So we'll, we have a case study for you to take a look at and apply some of your expertise to. You'll read the case study, you'll have a recorder and a reporter like last time, and you'll talk about these three items, the students' obstacles to graduate from high school, obstacles life in your context face, and then any strategies or supports that help life in your context on their path toward graduation. And I noticed, for example, in the chat, Laura just mentioned they have a graduation coach at her high school, but she's wondering, you know, what kinds of supports are there for SLIFE? Like, what is that coach doing, maybe? And so we'll just have you then share one takeaway with the whole group. And we'll give you up to 15 minutes to get started with this. So you'll be looking at document three. And Shannon, do you think we're ready to? Break out? I think we're good. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, so you just went to your breakout groups and talked about um, this scenario and then applied it, looked at your own context. Um, maybe Shannon, can we have the next slide? All right, well, definitely up to three group reporters. We'll have two. <laughs> <laughs> um, so how about group one? You can share one obstacle to um, SLIFE graduation and then one strategy. We can start off talking about the case study first. Okay, um, I, I'm the reporter for group one, so I'll share. Um, we looked at the student's description and we thought some of the obstacles that he would be facing um, would include being 17 and only having five years of school. So there's a gap in educational years there. Um, so there would be probably some content, some um, student habits, as well as language that he would need support with. We also thought there's a good chance that he might be experiencing um, or have experienced trauma and may need support with that um, in order to feel confident and ready for an academic environment. Mm -hmm. um, am I forgetting something, guys? I feel like we had a long list and I, <laughs> I'm not looking at it right now. Um, well, we also thought with a family recently resettled with six children and, um, and the father unknown if he's living still, that there might be quite a bit of stress, potentially family um, finances or just living situation could be very stressful. And that um, if he has a lot of family responsibilities, that could also be a barrier. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Did group two have any additional comments about Simon? Well, we we talked a lot about that gap and we also talked about uh, students who have difficulty um, envisioning themselves being able to complete their education or graduate and um, how the family expectations influence um, a student's expectations of themselves. And um, Laura talked about uh, the importance of the advocacy that the school staff play in helping the students to navigate um, between what the school's expectations are and what their expectations and their family expectations are. Laura, do you want to add to that? No, I mean, I think that that's pretty much what we were saying too. You know, like the, one of the troubles, that, well, that not troubles, but one of the realities is that when they're 17 years old, they may not choose to continue to go to school. They may choose to continue to go. They may choose to go to work. Mm -hmm. So they might not be interested in graduation. Right. When there is an immediate reward through work, right? You have that paycheck every week as opposed to something that's way off in the future and is more abstract. And, you know, like you said, they might not envision themselves as a graduate and what that might mean. Yeah. Thank you. And so we go ahead. Well, we also have. Um, girls that are at this age where um, the family wants them to marry and there are arranged marriages that are occurring. Um, and the girls know that that's what's going to happen. So that it, it's, they quite often lose motivation um, to, to strive with academics. And so as Laura was saying, giving them um, some realistic practical reasons for learning basic math skills so that you can have a bank account and um, be functional with your money. Um, 
getting a driver's license, those kinds of things to be motivated, you know, to, to give them a reason uh, beyond their own uh, frame of reference. Yeah, thank you. So applying this just to in your own context. So we talked about obstacles for Simon. So what are obstacles that you see in your context that prevents life? Is there anything in, in addition that you would like to, to add? Talked about working, maybe having to get married. Staffing. So many of us, we don't have um, enough ESOL staff uh, in the schools to um, provide the amount of support that our life students um, need mm -hmm. to accelerate their learning. Mm -hmm. And we, we, have, we have some schools that don't have anybody. <laughs> they, they should, but they don't. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a huge obstacle. Mm -hmm. We talked about something similar in our group that here in the mid coast and central northern Maine, um, schools that have multilingual learner populations tend to have very small populations. And so they don't have a SLIF program in place. And perhaps a very experienced ESOL teacher may have never worked with a SLIF student before. So there would be a learning curve, and that takes time. And I've seen situations where the student becomes very frustrated, they're coming to school. They're very frustrated that they feel like their needs aren't being met. They're being marginalized in the classroom. And so they, they drop out. And it's, it's often to work because their, their parents and their cousins and whoever else they know, it is, they're already working and they're contributing to the family's needs. So maintaining motivation while the school gets a system together to meet the needs of the student is a real obstacle. I mean, another challenge, an obstacle is um, finding the staff within, like this would be a high school setting, that have um, the experience or willingness to teach foundational skills. Mm -hmm. Teachers say, I don't know how to teach reading from the beginning. Yeah. Or, you know, I teach algebra. I don't teach number concepts and addition and subtraction. Uh, and, and where do I get the materials? Um, yeah, and materials that are not childish exactly. for right. the newcomers, for those life students, absolutely. Yeah, that's always been a challenge. Yeah, yeah so lots of obstacles. Did you, were you able to talk about the strategies or supports that helps life? on their path towards graduation? Didn't get there yet? No. That's okay. We'll get there next. We will. So let's see. So we're going to share with you, and of course, while validating all of your experiences, whether you're in a low incidence district or have larger number of SLIFE students, so many obstacles, right? Um, and we'll share with you a framework for increasing SLIFE's graduation rates. So we have five um, areas that we've brought together and we're gonna go through them a little bit more in depth next, but just here they are looking at the program considerations, instruction considerations, socio-emotional support and mentoring, some kind of unique considerations and collaboration. So you may have guessed that we're not going to just share this with you. We're going to have you um, go in and dig around. We're going to do a jigsaw on the framework. Oops, we're not using breakout rooms. I guess that we're going to, well, we have one breakout room. We're going to strategically pair two of you, but the others will look individually and you will, um, I'll put the, updated directions here in the chat, just so you can be seeing that. As I well. can do that for you, Diane, while you talk through okay. it. 
I had it copied okay. and pasted ready to go. Um, yeah, thanks though. So you'll have about 15 minutes, maybe 10 to 15 minutes to see which um, of the five components you'll be looking at. And you'll be working in document four to just go through each. Yeah, do, could you share, Shannon, your screen to show document four? Because it's, yeah. Thank you. So as always, your directions are in the second slide. And so there are, for the program considerations, yeah. There we go. <laughs> Perfect. <clears throat> so if, for example, if you're working on the first consideration programs, there are, I think we have three slides of content. We have some sample pathways, a coursework checklist. And then if you're working on this, if this is your topic, you'll just type some notes. What do you notice? What do you appreciate about it? And what do you wonder? What questions do you have? And then you can synthesize that at the bottom with a statement to share back to everyone. So we don't have that many people. I'm wondering if we go back to the component slide, Shannon. So slide 25, oops, it's not 25. This, this one, okay, it is 25. Um, does, is there any component that stands out to you that you'd like to work on? Slide. Yeah, so if you look at Shannon's screen, you see program, instructions, social emotional support, unique considerations and collaboration. What do you mean by program? Um, so uh, just the um, different types of coursework, um, programmatic decisions that would that could affect uh, graduation. Let me pull up that slide as well. Those slides, I should say. Courses, sample pathways. We have um, sample pathways to graduation, a coursework checklist. Basically, how you're going to design that program for for your slave to make sure that they have that pathway to graduation. And I'm just wondering if it might we we can still randomly, since we will need a one breakout room, um, we can randomly put you assign like we were originally thinking, and that way you can explore uh, one of those components. And then when we share back, you might find whether it's something as we go on the item at the end when you're setting goals might change from whatever program com framework component you might be exploring now. That yeah. might be a little easier. Yeah, I was thinking of being a bit more democratic, but I think we'll all, <laughs> you all might want to do the same one. So just in the interest of having coverage, is it okay if we go ahead and assign? Yeah. All right. Um, I have one question before you get started. Sure. Um, I'm pretty sure like, I just flipped through the slides, but the one that is about, um, hang on, instruction considerations, or maybe it's programming. I'm not quite sure which one it is, but one of the things that is complicated with a slice is, how does this child meet standards for graduation when they cannot read or write at that level? Yeah, and that's what you can unpack a little bit more in this, you know, when we're looking at this jigsaw. Okay. Um, I have created uh, breakout rooms. Um, there are five of them. Uh, obviously, there are six of you. So four of you are going to be alone. That just means that Whatever group you're assigned, that's the component that you're going to explore. Um, feel free to go to the breakout room uh, and or just stay here. And you're more than welcome to just turn your camera off while you work. Um, and I will open those up if that's okay, Diane. Yep. We'll go and 
what I think we said fi about 15 minutes for us to work before um, coming back and we'll share. Yeah, and then it'll be time for a break after that. Yes. Yeah. Welcome back from our break. We're gonna start by sharing out from the Jigsaw and Laura and Robin. We're hoping that you can go first, Laura. I think you have a time constraint. Oh, and you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so basically what is interesting about this instructional considerations slide is that it presumes that the child is in a class that is on the child's level, which is not the case in my, most of the low incidence part of Maine. So that being said, right? Um, if the child is in a class where the material is appropriate for both the, con the, the grade level expectations and the child's English abilities, then you can, there's a lot of things you can do. Um, you can take a book and you can illustrate the book with pictures. You can highlight key pieces, key words in the, that book. You can pick out grammatical pieces of that book that you need for that child to really understand. Um, you can have people draw the book and retell, or not the book, but draw a section and then verbally talk it through and then write it. And in, as a result of that, you can work with vocabulary, you can work with grammar, you can work with the um, structures that you need in English. Um, you can be working on the social languages that you need to talk to each other as you're doing with that. You can talk about school culture and routines as part of that class. Where Robin and I got stuck, or really where I got stuck, is that it's actually very unlikely for an older student to be in a class like that because an older student in sixth, seventh, eighth, tenth grade is going to be put in tenth grade English, but they don't read English. And even if the teacher reads the story out loud or they watch a movie and then the child, then the student gets that exposure to the, the content of the book and maybe the vocabulary of the book, or maybe the literary devices of the book or whatever the theme of the book that the, the reason that they're teaching this book in English, for example, or the same thing in math, if they get exposure to algebra or percents or something, if the student doesn't know how to add, subtract, multiply and divide, how are they gonna do percents? And when in their day are they going to get time to do that? Because as soon as you take time to teach them the content, when are they supposed to get the stuff, the skills that they're missing so that they can eventually get there? What are they gonna not have in order to get that extra time? Would anyone like to respond and maybe what you're doing in your context in this type of a situation? Um, I think it's a great question, Laura, and I don't have a ton of experience working with SLIF students, but in the conditions that I have in the past, you're right, they do miss other things in the day in order to have that specialized instructional time. I think I've always tried to focus on creating a balance so that students aren't missing a lot of meaningful time with their peers. And on the other hand, knowing how valuable the time is for them to gain those um, reading skills or math skills that they are not bringing with them when they arrive. I do, I think it's, in my experience, it's a tricky balance. And it depends, oftentimes it depends on the student. Sometimes students can thrive um, with peers because they're willing to take the chances and interact. And other times students really do need that time away from the group to feel confident in practicing those skills. I mean, I almost hope that we would have like five or six life students all in the same grade. 
because then you could then you then you can make a group and you're like great we're not going to read this book <laughs> we're going to take the same grade level expectations and we're going to read a different book and then the kid gets exactly what they need but mm -hmm. i have, to have enough kids not i but the you know the district has to have enough kids that are more or less at the same level and more or less at the same grade in order to do that and mm -hmm. where we are now it's like you you know you have the the pong right you have ding 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 they they come from all over right uh -huh. but it's very and i can work my butt off to try to adapt whatever the mainstream teacher is doing but i'm doing it for one kid in one class in one grade and then i have to do it <laughs> you know uh -huh. it's, it's it's crazy and the mainstream teachers try right like i was saying to robin the mainstream teachers can do it it's easier in science right because science you're like fine we're going to talk about I don't know, natural disasters. They pick one, they can show it, they can do all these things, right? They can talk about it, they can draw it, they can make diagrams, they can do a lot with science. <laughs> social studies sometimes, depending on how abstract the social studies lesson is. And English, it depends, right? If the teacher's like, no, we're teaching this book, we're not teaching another book. If you teach a whole different book, who's going to read the book with that student? Who's going to check on comprehension for that me or the teacher right if you want them do you see what i'm saying you're doing you're subdividing the class or you're doing school within a school so it's frustrating diane what have you um have you run into this in your work uh with other states and i think shannon was gonna jump in and kind of lead us to talking about programming because this really goes hand in hand. Okay. Yeah, and I think um, Diana and I uh, talked uh, through program considerations and I think somewhere that's kind of at the heart of what, you, what you're really focusing on too, Laura, is um, without having some of those programming considerations, you do feel like you're playing whack-a-mole solving all of these individual uh, instructional pieces. And I think, I, I know we were looking at it from that uh, SLIFE coursework, but even so, it starts with, yeah, like Rebecca said, they might have to take a foundational math class. Um, and there are probably other kids that need that foundational math class too. And that m may be something that they take before they take that credit bearing course. And I think that's some of those pieces and that's um, in those program considerations. Um, one of the mm -hmm. examples is um, from Fairfax, Virginia of how they've looked at some of those pathways of maybe you need to take some foundational courses before you get to English 10 um, because the literacy, that foundational literacy piece is such a huge lift for you at that point. And it is tougher when you are have one student, but if you're able to do a foundational course, you can pull all of maybe your middle school students together. I don't even, I'm not sure if that you can do that in your context, but uh, it was a grand hope. Uh, but then it's also looking at scheduling just as a whole, because sometimes master schedules uh, get in the way of you being able to do that. So it becomes a more programmatic issue. And Diane, I think I feel like I'm going to steal Diana's thunder, but I know one of the things that she shared that she did appreciate was that that checklist uh, and even just the um, the different pathways of just having those resources to really look at how can we do this differently, and that might be a good starting point. Laura is looking at from just a system standpoint of this doesn't work when we have students that are newcomers that come into our system because we don't have the flexibility to meet their needs. So how can we work with our system to change the programming? And I'd also wanna know your administrators, how on board are they to providing support, right? And thinking outside the box a bit for these lower numbers of students, but you're inevitably going to have more. I think the administrators want the classroom teachers to modify. But there is a difference between, again, using this book that's in front of me, right? Using this thick book, right? And how would you, to teach a book that's at a different level is to teach a different book. That's not modifying. That's a whole different class. So who does that work? 
Yeah. It is a good question. If you talk to an elementary teacher, they'll tell you, well, I've got three or four or five different books going on <laughs> mm -hmm. in my class. We're not all reading one book. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's there's a way to have different books on the same theme um, and, and be teaching um, the skills that those students need that are grouped together. But if that's not how the middle school is geared to work with their curriculum, um, I was talking to some math teachers um, and and everybody to do everything the same way. And these new, they're just little first graders, but they have no numeracy skills. And the first grade teachers are saying, I, I can't, I can't help them because I can only do something this way because of the math curriculum. And that's usually what the grades they have flexibility yeah can you hear me you're breaking up a lot robin i'm not sure if it's your connection uh in the interest of of i know we have a lot to share but we would like to talk about uh the third component The socio-emotional piece. Yeah, and that was that yeah. was me. Um, so just briefly, something that I noticed about this is that it does it does sort of address what we know is so essential for newcomer students and SLIFE students, especially, is that you have to address the whole person. And this gives some really concrete steps as how to do that. I, I like that about it. I, I felt like anyone could look at this and kind of walk through and be reminded or learn each piece. And it's, it's easy to forget how important each piece is, but when we have SLIFE students, they can remind us, right? <laughs> because they, they might, they live struggling and we have to figure out why. So this is a good way of looking through, have we addressed these factors that might be standing in the way for the student. Bye, Laura, thanks. Um, and then I wondered if, if there are any good examples around the nation um, of a structured systematic model that schools are implementing around this. Um, I know some schools have done a really beautiful job, for example, with having a a systematic model around graduation or around working with crediting students for their their work or knowledge that they're bringing. And I, I wondered if anyone had known a district that really has a great handle on this and a way, in a way that they use the resources within the school and community to work on these things. That's, that's what I wondered. Um, how could this be part of the, Frame, part of the framework, oh my gosh, it's getting late. <laughs> How could this part of the framework be beneficial in your context? Well, in my context, <clears throat> as an ESOL consultant, I think this is a great thing to be able to share with districts who are just getting started or having their first experiences with SLIFE students. Because one thing I see, that we see, is that these students are just getting placed in a classroom. And one thing that's helpful to share with schools, teachers, administrators, is that it's very important to address social and emotional needs first. Simultaneously, but really first, like you have to plan for it. So I think this would be a great resource, resource to have that conversation around. Great, right. And Rebecca, you asked for, you know, a school district that's doing this well. So this comes from Fairfax County Schools yeah. in Virginia that 
have had SLIFE students, you know, ever since the program got started with the influx of v Vietnamese students, mm -hmm. um, you know, several decades ago now. So, yeah, I would look to, you know, to what they're doing. Um, so, and I'm happy to connect you with them also to get more of a sense. I mean, you know, it's a very large school district, but if we're creative, we can often take components of what larger school districts are doing and adapt them, knowing there's not a one-to-one -one fit, but, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. I would, I would love to see that. Okay, I will make a note. Should we look at the next component? Let me, oops. The unique support. So that was me. And um, just looking at it in my context here at school, I have no SLIFE students and have not had any. However, I feel like a lot of our newcomers fit into this description and actually some of the kids have been with us for a little bit um i think there's a lot of similarities um this component <laughs> is suggesting basically differentiation which we all should be doing anyway um with intensive literacy for pre-literate students using um a different type of grading, you know, modified grading is a um, checklist kind of form in one of the slides. I think um, it also in a couple places mentions goal setting, which I think is really important for the student to set goals, but also to work with the family, which the family engagement piece is also important um, for both social and academic goals. Um, I feel like it kind of assumes that all the teachers will be on board, say, with the type of grading, which I keep thinking about our secondary students thinking that would never fly with a lot of the teachers. Uh, the elementary teachers, I think, have a different perspective on things. Mm -hmm. um, I wondered about the um, staff to teach, for example, intensive literary, literacy, it was, again, at the secondary level. And I like what you said, Robin, that, gee, if you ask an elementary teacher, they will have four different books going on, you know, but the high school teachers, um, like Laura was saying, that that just isn't going to work in their um, perspective. And I don't know if they want to shift their paradigms. Um, I am curious as to how other schools with low incidence um, numbers of ELLs would do this if, or have experience with it because like, we are considered a low incidence district here in Maine. Um, it, getting back to the pieces of it, it also mentions credit recovery, which in our district credit recovery is winter school or summer school. So getting kids to attend that can be a challenge. And, um, Oh, the grading was an equitable grading. I just came across on my notes, um, which I believe in, but I, as I said, I don't know what other teachers would say. I would say in my experience with even newcomers, I've had very good support about getting one-on-one -on -one staff. Like a, we hire as, as a tutor to work with kids who have very um, minimal English until we can get them going a bit mm -hmm. sometimes we've had these tutors work with one student for you know more than a year sometimes two or three years depending on the student mm -hmm. yeah so i've had good support that way but i'm not sure that that's going to be the case in all districts no i think you're lucky in that case kathy that your that your administrators are willing to bring in new staff to meet the needs of individual students i do think that's rare yeah, um, yeah, it is, and it is great. And um, the biggest problem, like for example, I had I was trying to find somebody last year, is that there aren't a lot of people out there that either want to do it or are mm -hmm. have any type of. It's not that you had to be a certified teacher, but just not having any type of background in it that mm -hmm. or any type of 
background in teaching or whatever. So Mm -hmm. finding somebody can be a trick, but I've had good support. I've also seen districts that have uh, had volunteer opportunities. You know, maybe they don't have the funds, but they've partnered and had those community collaborations where people were willing to come in. And if you give me the exact steps of what I have to do, I'd be glad to tutor and, you know, volunteer my time. So that's another way to leverage, especially, you know, in the state of finances uh, can be, can vary. Right. And now that we can have actually have volunteers in the schools again, we haven't been able to. Yeah, that right. <laughs> yeah. That might be a possibility, but the past two years that has not been um, a possibility. So, yeah, things are opening back up, thankfully. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And the, the tutoring aspect really, you know, research shows, right, that when you are really targeting what an individual child needs, that can really have such an impact and move the needle so much. It just makes me think of what Laura had shared previously. Maybe tutoring could be something to look into for, you know, very, very low incidence populations. Mm-hmm. So we can circle back with her about that. Yeah, I know, um, Diane, that she, she does have that model in her district that um, they have more ESOL staff now, but for a long time, it was Laura and a group of tutors that Oh, okay. With. So I know she's familiar with it, but I don't know if they might have shifted their model slightly in order mm-hmm. to have the um, additional ESOL staff that they have okay. now. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other thing, I don't, I don't know if Kathy's still there, but I was going to say that sometimes, hi Kathy, some in my right. experience, and and I was in like the Winslow area, just that, you know, which is another low incidence population, and I found that. So the middle school and high school teachers, especially, sometimes they just needed someone to give them permission mm-hmm. to look at it differently, to grade differently, to set up the instruction differently. Um, and if I talked to them and gave them a list of, you know, ways that they could alter what they were doing, they would say, oh, is this okay to do? I, could, I can do that. And then they would do it. Not everybody and not always, but a lot of times they're just looking, they don't want to get in trouble. They don't want to take responsibility for a decision that they don't know a lot about. But sometimes you can get that flexibility just by saying, you know, it's okay to do this. This is good practice. Mm-hmm. And you don't know unless you ask, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. And I've had, um, <clears throat> I'm going to say challenges with um, the guidance counselors when we've had newcomers come in terms of just putting ELLs in classes because they don't speak much English. Well, we're going to put them in special ed classes. No. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, things like that. We had a student mm-hmm. who came from Houston after the hurricane a few years ago. Mm-hmm. The guidance counselor said he's got to make up the whole first quarter. I said, no. <laughs> I don't. So I talked to our su- I, my assistant superintendent, who's our ELL director, and said, this is what's going on. He said, that student will not be making up the first quarter. He wasn't in school because of the hurricane, <laughs> but it, you know. Anyway, so just getting through some of those hurdles with uh-huh. um, a difference of opinion, I guess, would be you know is is um, the same as kind of what you're talking about, Rebecca, with the, the yeah. grading. Like, oh, I also have found guidance counselors, high school guidance counselors, to be the least flexible people on earth. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so it's you, you got to oh, have good. a conversation after conversation, and eventually something sometimes clicks and they start remembering to consider that there are other ways to think about it. Yeah. But there, there's a lot of rules about high school guidance counselor <laughs> roles. I, I feel like once you get one, a, a, a counselor that really gets it, it yeah. clicks and yeah. like it does click and they go, they, they, they bend over backwards then to be able to help support students, but it's until they understand. And I think that's with all of us. And I would advocate, you know, along those lines to cluster, which if you have that one guidance counselor where it does click, then maybe that guidance counselor is, you know, they have the ESOL students or the life students in their caseload. Yeah. That's what that, 
That's mm -hmm. exactly what we did is yeah. that one counselor that it clicked with and he really understood that need. Uh, he also was then there. He, he understood the, the tug between I can work but I really want an education. So he could have those conversations with the students. He, he, he got it. And so that was his part, just part of his caseload then. Yeah. Yeah. One other thing, when I was at the high school level, my fellow ESOL teachers and I, we would go through each of our students' schedules, their coursework to make sure they were in the proper courses that would put them on a path to graduation. And in many cases, they weren't. In many cases, I remember a, a French speaking student from Africa that we advocated for that student to get put in AP French and he wouldn't have been otherwise. Um, mm -hmm. And so just going through on a case, if you have a small number of students, that's something you can do on a smaller scale, go through those, you know, the, their uh, coursework, their schedules, and just make sure they're on that path. Mm -hmm. It's 437. Let's go to our next <laughs> topic. And collaboration. I think Hannah had to leave. So this is something, you know, of course, this is all about collaboration. So we encourage you to take a look at the information in the slides. So thank you for engaging in this jigsaw with us. And Robin, thanks for your note about uncertified tutors or volunteers. Yeah, so which, we just looked at the five components. Which one right now is the most important to you? You can put it in the chat. You can just unmute. I think to me, number one, programming feels really important because I think one of our goals here in Maine is to help schools and districts formulate a structure that can be ongoing, yeah. no matter who is staffing that structure. Um, we experience as teachers and as, uh, and as consultants, things go well if you have a really strong teacher who's been there 10 years, but when the teacher leaves, the structure falls apart. And so we would really like to see a system and a structure in place that lives with the school or the district rather than lives inside only the teacher. Right, and where I, like you said, when that one teacher goes, all of that institutional knowledge goes with them. Yeah. And that's what we wanna prevent, right? So, so much is dependent on the programming and having that strong component in place. Yeah. Did anyone have a different component? Well, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, for me, I think it's because of the day that it is and um, the week that I've had. Uh, uh, I've been trying to support teachers who were talking uh, and the challenges of just what Laura was talking about. Mm -hmm. um, so they're mainstream classrooms and they, they don't have any support. Um, from any, you know, there, there's a program, but it isn't servicing these level one students. Uh, so in terms of how to help these teachers who, who want to do right by all the students in their room. Um, so instruction. Thanks. Shannon, shall we? I think I, I think we're all fading into this wonderful <laughs> evening. <laughs> I don't know if you were on earlier when I was saying evening at like three o'clock in the afternoon. I, I did hear that. Yeah. <laughs> well, Shannon, just it's so cloudy here in Maine. It's so dark, and it's now it's completely black outside. So you're not wrong. <laughs> yeah. And uh, night the three o'clock here. So. Um, we do want to give you an opportunity to set some goals. I know we had a really good discussion uh, once again uh, about just what this all means for you and me. Um, but uh, we do have in document uh, five, and I'll add that into the chat that, oh, 
Thank you, Diane. Uh, to, we have a graduation goal setting and planning document. Um, instead of reviewing for 10 minutes, how about you just take some about five minutes, think about that component that you really wanted to focus on. Um, and then uh, and I'm going to bring it up here for a moment so that we can see. Sometimes find it's a little helpful to look at the document as I talk about it. Um, you can see that you can assess it. Look at that component. I know, Rebecca, you mentioned programming. You could just look in that section of programming and kind of see where your mind goes. And at the bottom, there is a section that you can identify that priority, that targeted outcome that you're looking for, and some action steps. Um, and even some of those talking points. I, I think about, you know, no matter what your context is, uh, there, there's always push back somewhere and being able to respond to that. So um, I'm gonna go back to the slide so you can see the directions here um, and feel free, make a copy of that, uh, set, some, set a goal and we'll come back in five minutes for you to share out your goal and, and wrap up. So I'll put a timer up for us so that we can see it. And I'm going to have to sign off, <laughs> just arriving early and leaving early today. So I wanted to thank you all so much for your participation and I hope everyone has a lovely holiday and a restful break. And we will be in touch afterwards and I'll share some more resources. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Diane. Thanks. I know we didn't have extensive planning this evening, um, but as you think about those next steps to the uh, that you're going to take and those goals, um, let me just move us forward here. We are not going to go into breakout groups for this um, because I think we're a breakout group in and of ourselves uh, at this point. So uh, it is. There anybody that would like to share uh, the component that they chose and um, maybe an action step or two that they plan to take? Well, I chose instruction and I, an action step would be to try to continue to meet with um, PLCs um, departmentally and if uh, examples and uh, you hear me? You're breaking up. Sorry. <laughs> Never mind. You keep trying, Robin. <laughs> um, this isn't a specific one of the numbers, but I just have this idea in my head about creating an overall checklist for districts who are new to um, serving SLIFE students and um, in sort of being able to build out from that checklist, sharing resources that cover these five considerations. Yeah, Maybe and uh, it's and, a goal. And, and we have a lot of like, even yeah. still that frame, that framework, there's a lot of material in there um, mm -hmm. and a lot of resources on the Padlet for you to be able to look through. Um, the, I, I think that's one of the biggest pieces is sometimes you don't even know where to start. Yeah. You know, yeah. not you, but just in general. You, in general, you, right. And even me, like if, if, it, if I were suddenly back in schools full time and I was a principal and I had a family of students who hadn't had a lot of schooling background, I would, you know, it, it would take some time for me to get my head around how are we as a district going to serve these students with the resources that we know we have at the moment. Kathy? Um, I also had looked at the instruction component and, um, one thing, one outcome would be, actually be professional development for teachers oh. would be a fantastic yeah. outcome, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think a one-time 
PD session. It was enough. It would you know have to be ongoing. Because um, I just thinking in terms of, um, and again, this is terrible. I keep going back to the high school teachers, but you know, in terms of the um, accessing the curriculum, the scaffolding and accommodations. Oh, I can just hear. I don't have time, or it's not not my not my forte, not my job. Yeah, I just I, anyway, when it is our jobs, um, that's what I find really frustrating. It's just this attitude sometimes. Um, but I think some, you know, in, I'm going to say intensive professional development would be, you know, yeah. like the best outcome. <laughs> And I, and I think that it, like, just like with everything we've said tonight, it's a, that balance of advocacy. And then once you start getting those teachers that are buying in, uh, leveraging them, uh, especially the teachers that are willing to make those accommodations and are willing to try new strategies. Um, you know, we can, I don't know, I, I always think you can always try to paddle upstream, but sometimes it's nice to float along with somebody who's willing to, to ride the waves with you. Yeah. Um, so sometimes it, it's a balance of the two. It's not that you stop advocating, but you're leveraging your allies as well. Yeah, and, and I shouldn't, I, I know it sounds really negative. There are secondary teachers that are very um, willing to um, be accommodating and and help our students, but there are some that are just not, I, I feel like, but anyway. And I, I, I think you see that in any context that you're in. Uh, but yeah, thanks for sharing. Um, so we, we did our debrief as well uh, in our, our little group. Uh, so just looking at our next steps, uh, just think about, in, implementing one or two of those recommendations, really focus on one component and maybe one piece of the, that action step uh, in your own context. Uh, and just take a moment to, to read this quote. Uh, it was from one of uh, Carol Salva's research participants. I think it speaks to sometimes it's the little thing that you do. It's not the big thing that makes a huge difference in a student's mm -hmm. life and in their outcome. That's great. And oh, I can t I always tell when we get to the part where we we get to that very end, uh, you know, because everybody has the beamy smile on their face, uh, <laughs> because it, it it is very hard. It, like it, as I was looking through uh, her research, that was one of the pieces that really spoke to me too. Is like sometimes you don't realize the impact you have with such little words. Mm -hmm. So thank you again for spending your uh, afternoon slash evening uh, with us uh, talking about post-graduation, uh, post-secondary opportunities for uh, our SLAFE. Uh, if you could provide us one last bit of uh, feedback, we greatly appreciate it because it can help us as we um, present the same content to other, uh, in other contexts as well. So we were really spent this afternoon discussing our barriers and solutions related to graduation and post-secondary success and exploring some of the strategies uh, to support our SLIFE uh, on this pathway and began to plan uh, ways to implement these strategies in whatever context we're in uh, today. And again, thank you so much for spending time with us this afternoon. Thanks, and Shannon. And I hope this sickness uh, leaves all of you or skips over all of you. Uh, and you all have a very restful break. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Thank Thanks, you. Nice to see everyone. You too. Take care.